All right, this is ecology lecture number two, symbiosis. So the, uh, the definition of symbiosis is when two organisms of different species live in close association with each other and at least one of them benefits. The first example of symbiosis or the first type of symbiosis that we're going to talk about is mutualism. And in mutualism, both species benefit. Um, with clownfish and sea anemones, the clownfish benefit because they can hide in the sea anemone from any um, fish species that would eat them, um, and they make it their home. And it's a good home because the um, polyp form of sea anemones have stinging tentacles, and so other fish can't get into the sea anemone to eat um, the clownfish. Now the clownfish can survive in the sea anemone because they have a layer of mucus covering the surface of their sc um, scales so that they themselves cannot get stung uh, by the sea anemone. Uh, sea anemones are actually cousins of um, jellyfish which you may have been stung by. So you might wonder then how does a sea anemone uh, benefit from the clownfish? Well there are species of fish that actually eat sea anemone. Um, one example would be the parrotfish, and any time one of those fish comes and tries to, you know, munch on the sea anemones, if there's a clownfish living in it, they will chase the other fish away. Now you may think that clownfish are not particularly intimidating, but many species of fish will just swim away if any sudden movement happens. So the clownfish dart at them, and then they swim away. Another example is any insect that pollinates a flower helps the flower reproduce and gets food in the process. And then the last example I want to talk about is termites and the protozoans that live in their guts. Now termites um, are known to be insects that can eat wood, but they can't digest the wood and break it down on their own. Uh, wood is made of cellulose and cellulose is a material that most organisms on the planet can't digest. However, there are some species of protozoans, which are single-celled organisms. They're more complex than bacteria, but they are still single-celled organisms, and they have a true nucleus and um, membrane-bound organelles, so they're not, in the, um, they're not a bacteria. They are eukaryotic cells, which you may, or not, may not be familiar with that term yet, but we will get back to it at another time. But the protozoans actually can break down the um, cellulose into sugar. So the termite, um, by giving the protozoan a place to live, and the termites deliver the wood right to the protozoans, the protozoans digest it and share the sugar with the termites. So in this case, they both benefit. You may wonder, how do the protozoans get inside the termite's digestive system? Every time termites are born, the mother termite spits in their mouth, and the protozoans in their saliva end up in their baby's guts. Kind of gross but really cool. The next type of symbiosis is referred to as commensalism. This one is the hardest one for students to remember. I think most people can figure out mutualism and parasitism, but with commensalism you have a plus for one and a zero for the other because the other one is not affected. Some scientists would argue that commensalism doesn't really exist and that there are situations in which we just don't know how one species is affected, but I feel like Barnacles on a whale is pretty clearly not hurting the whale, but helping the barnacles, and I'll explain that. So barnacles are small filter feeders in that they eat plankton from the water that flows through them, and barnacles can um, attach to um, docks or the bottom of a boat. But if you're a barnacle and you're very lucky, the best place to attach is on the bottom of a whale because Whales eat plankton, and so they're likely to follow the plankton, and so there's always going to be an abundance of food wherever the whales are. And you might say, oh, well then they're competing for food. But not really. There's lots and lots of plankton, um, and barnacles eat so little that it really doesn't affect how much food that the whale gets. The whale is getting plenty of food. It's sort of like if you're at a picnic, and a crumb falls off of your food, and an ant eats it, you're not starving because you lost that crumb of food. So in this case, perfect example. Um, another example is a burdock seed with hooked tips. You may have pulled these out of the fur from your dog, um, especially if you have a dog with long fur, and they basically just get caught in your dog's fur and then dispersed far away from the parent plant so that the parent plant and the offspring do not have to compete for resources. It doesn't harm your dog at all to have a little seed stuck in its fur. 
and eyelash mites. Yes, you might have these in your eyelashes. The last type of symbiosis is referred to as parasitism, in which one benefits and the other is harmed. Pinworms are an example, and they live in the intestines of mice and humans. About one-third of U.S. children um, will contract pinworms. It's fairly um, easily treatable with a medication. Um, it's just a simple, chewable medication that will then kill the pinworms and won't harm the child. Um, these are contracted through uh, fecal contamination, which means poop, and typically happens when small children are playing in sandboxes um, like that an animal has gone number two in. So the best way to prevent your kids from getting pinworms in the future is to make sure that when you get a sandbox, you get a lid for it and keep it covered when you're not using it. Some other examples of parasites would be um, ticks or fleas or leeches or tapeworms. Um, I think the most interesting example of parasitism is um, the braconid wasp laying eggs on a tomato hornworm. So this green guy is a tomato hornworm and if you're a gardener you do not like them because they eat the leaves on your tomato plants and less you know or fewer leaves means less photosynthesis and therefore smaller tomatoes. But what happens is that the wasp will actually sting the tomato hornworm and paralyze it and then lay its eggs on it. And of course the um, hornworm, the tomato hornworm is still alive, but when the eggs hatch, they eat the, the um, organism. So they lay their eggs on, on a fresh food. Now, we're not exactly sure which category this fits into, but there is an isopod which eats certain species of fish's tongue and then replaces it and then shares the food and it doesn't seem to affect the fish that much. So maybe commensalism, maybe parasitism. There's really no way to know if it you know, hurts because we can't ask a fish.